the context in which the content of our learning takes place. We spend a lot of time on what we do, but the context in which it is done and the context in which people might use what we do is sometimes more important than what we are doing. So you have a line here and you were to you are to shorten it without rubbing it. So you know the answer, you draw a bigger line. Now here begins the context of my story today. So what has got changed here? The context. What did it change? The content. The same line became smaller. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to change the context in which designers choose the problem and try to solve them, address them, scientists pick up a problem and do research on it. But very often or many times, the context in which this solution is going to be used if it succeeds is not as apparent to us as it should be. So how do we do that? So one of the ways in which we try to address this problem for my own learning and learning of our colleagues in Honeybee Network was to walk in different parts of the country. So the concept of voluntary suffering is very fundamental to what Honeybee Network does. When I try to find a solution which is addressing my own problem, I'm not doing any favor to anybody. I'm not doing any obligation on anybody else. That becomes some way than shield, certain shield or empathetic innovations. And empathy, which is not equivalent to, to Samvedana because Samvedana is within, empathy is for others, helps us to identify those problems, those pain points, which otherwise we might ignore because they may not affect our life. So we have been giving voice, visibility and velocity to the ideas of common people. If they could do so much through their own efforts, they could do much more with our sharing, joining hand with them. If people who do not have much material resources have to survive, what would they do? What would they maximize? They don't have much material resources. So they will maximize their mental resources, imagination, experimentation, innovation. So innovation is imperative for them. They don't have choice. So we will discuss today first about 10 teachers from whom we have learned over the years through various processes, Shodhyatra. And these 10 teachers are accessible to each one of us. You don't have to come to me to find these 10 teachers. The reason why we call it Honeybee Network is Honeybee does what we don't do, what intellectuals like us don't do. Honeybee is cross-pollinate. Idea is to connect ideas of one with another. When they take nectar away, flowers don't complain. And they don't keep all the honey with themselves. They share some with us. So when we take knowledge of people, do we acknowledge them? Do they become co-authors with us in our reports and publications? All the 1050 patents filed by National Innovation Foundation are in the name of the innovators. Not one of them has co-inventorship of the staff or scientists who have worked on them. We said, okay, when you write papers, you can become co-author, put the innovator and your name together. We don't mind that. But intellectual property right, that will remain of the person. So the asymmetry that exists between knowledge producer and provider in the informal sector and knowledge producer and provider in the formal sector, we have tried to bridge that gap. One of the questions that has bothered me is that many great civilizations sometimes decline. And they decline because they don't communicate much. They don't share much. They become self-contained. A professor doesn't talk to the next professor next door. The student doesn't talk to the student in the dorm. We become secretive. The more secretive you become, the less feedback you get. It is only the criticism from the peers and from the colleagues that know about our subject or at least can ask some strange questions which help our ideas to grow. So how do we create that culture of sharing and building upon each other's ideas? That was one of the concerns that we have because we didn't want our society to decline. And how did we do that? 
So we realize that we are looking for creative people. Creative people are everywhere. Just outside of IIT Bombay, there is a person who often binds your thesis. Hmm? Black cover thesis. And you know there is the embossing done on that. <coughs> Title of the thesis in golden color. He designed a printer for embossing your thesis covers. Which will print whichever film you use, he will print with that color. And we thought he deserved to be recognized. May not have been studied much, may not have been educated much, but had creativity, he could design something outside of the boundary of IIT. There are creative people all over. No matter which place we get, went, we have found creative people. In Burger, district of Orissa, when we had a show, the Atta there in summer, very hot place. Said to be a poor place of poor people, but people may be poor economically, they are not poor in their mind. That was the subtitle of my, my, my book in 2016, Mind on the Margin are not Marginal Minds. So this person had designed a loom where he wove the kurta in a cylindrical manner. All of it, imagine the complexity of this task. As an engineer, as a designer, just think of the complexity. Why would he do that? Not everybody stitches that. I have to do something different. I have to do something better. This desire to be different motivates this couple to design something that was unthinkable. Now our horizon has expanded. Now we can think of that. In sweater it was easier because with this knitting you could do that. But in weaving, that was the first time. So what are we trying to do? We are mapping creativity, we are tapping the innovations of the people who are solving problems innovatively, and we want to cap the inertia. Some inertia is inevitable, of course. We can't change everything all the time. But some of the inertia in our society has been far too long. You have seen hand pump? So if you have to drink water, what do you do with the hand pump? Single, you are alone. Then what happens? Water comes in some time and then you go back and some water spills over in the, in the time that you went there. You have so much water to waste. So what should be the design? He is saying, you bring the pipe closer to the handle. What else can you do? Quickly, just tell me. Ah, look at that first issue that I told you is less material. We want minimum material and maximum efficiency. So, this is the handle. How will you take it? This side. Correct? Pump it, drink it. So, you can make the pipe the hand, just pull down the pipe. When you pull the pipe down, if you push it down as a pump, you need much more pressure. The liver, why are we using this long bar? To use as, as a liver, you know, to, you know what liver does. Then make the pipe longer. You'll ultimately save material of the handling. Now we have not added any extra material in this design solution. That way you'll be removing material. No, we have just put this handle this side. I said, if you make the pipe longer. No, but Question is, if I don't use anything extra, first attempt is minimize use of extra material. If possible, reduce some. Because material creates, creates entropy. Correct? The question is, for such a long time, for millions of hand pump, we continue to bear and live with inefficient design. Why is our society so tolerant of inertia and inefficiency? So what happens then? Somehow, we reduce the expectation from ourselves. We think our life is less precious. We think we matter less. We don't deserve an efficient service or design. It's okay if, as an Indian, I can live with inefficiency. Because we have somehow been taught 
to accept we are conformist society, we are congruent society, we are compliant society. We don't question enough. Every innovation is a response to a question. Now I will show you some teachers from whom I have learned and I am sure you can also learn. Teacher of 25,000 years. You know which, where from this cave painting is? There is a place in central India, Bimbeteka. 25,000 years ago, a design teacher is teaching us and at that time there was no language, there was no community, there was no civilization. It's all about 10,000 year old. And teacher is telling us, okay, take two lines, make a cross, one line, make a double cross, a double line, Put a head there, circle, to draw lines, and that's how you can make a human figure. Move them in different directions and you can make different actions. So we can see now these human figures on horse, on the simple design at its simplest beauty, isn't it? It is possible to communicate so well that there is no loss of information, even for 25,000 years. Let's go to the next teacher. So, 2000 years ago, a teacher asked a student to bring a glass of water. Student brought the glass of water. Teacher took the water, gave the empty glass to the student. The student went and kept the glass in the kitchen. Teacher called him back. So, what did you do? Sir, you asked me for a glass of water. I brought the glass of water. You took the water. I went back and kept the empty glass in the kitchen. No, no, no. Tell me what did you do? And he will ask this question and the student will repeat this five times, seven times, ten times. And obviously, the teacher was not satisfied. The student said, Sir, I know now what I did. Tell me what did you do? Sir, I went to the kitchen. You, when you asked me for a glass of water, I brought the glass of water. You took the water. You gave me the empty glass. While going back, I threw just a few drops on the ground. When he said just a few drops, he got his zen. He should have dropped those few drops in a garden, in a drinking water plate for the birds. No, 2000 years ago, there was no shortage of water. For next 1950 years, there was not going to be any shortage of water. Correct? Population was so little, there were so many lakes, rivers. Why is the teacher building a value of saving a drop of water 2000 in advance? He anticipated the problem of our society so much early. Are we going to solve problems only of tomorrow, today? Who will solve the problem that will arise after 500 years, 1000 years, 2000 years? Who will solve that problem? This teacher is solving that problem, isn't it? He made us conscious. We may not keep that conscious intact, that's a different matter. But there are people who will not keep the tap open when you go in the morning and wash your hands three times with the soap. The tap can remain open or you can close it every time. Put the wash, soap on your hand, then open it again then wash, then close, then wash, then close. We can do that, isn't it? Some of you might be doing it actually. Those who realize that this water should not go waste. Some of you may not be doing it. But the, the thought arises in the mind, am I doing right? That thought, the seed of that thought, this teacher has planted. Now let me take you to a teacher I met 20 years ago. We were walking in desert in Kutch. So I saw a shepherd who had about 200 sheep. I asked him, I waved him, I asked him, I had to stop, it was very hot, I was tired, so I thought, let's do a little fun. So we waved the hand, please stop, he stopped. So I thought, I'm a professor from IMA, management professor, very reputed professor, very wise. So I may be asking a very intelligent question. So I said, if one of your sheep gets mixed with the herd of another, what will you do? I was having a program of the Shodhyatta in my hand. Shepherd heard me. He said, please give me this piece of paper. So I gave him the piece of paper. He put the whole program in front of his. He said, to me, all the letters look alike. You know, it was a slap on my face. To me, all the sheep looked alike. That's why I asked that question. It was one of the most foolish questions I have ever asked in my life. And he gave me a slap almost. He said, look, I am illiterate in your language. You are illiterate in my language. What's the difference between us? You can't make out difference between two sheep. I can. I know each sheep is in unique, which is true. This teacher is accessible to all of us. That's what I'm trying to say. Let me take you another teacher. So there was a film being made by Jayanti Bhai from Indian Space Research Organization. So we went to Karim Bhai, North Gujarat. 
near a forest, Balaram Jasore Sanctuary. On the fringe of that sanctuary, this village Virampur was there. So he, there was a stone, he asked him to sit down there. I was sitting on another stone and he was setting his camera. And then he said, well, sir, it will be nice if he had a twig of a plant or a shrub in his hand. That would look nice. We are going to talk about herbal healing. He was a potter, but he used to heal the people. So I plucked a small twig from the roadside plant, a weed, gave it to Karim Bhai, and Karim Bhai got upset. So I said, what happened? Why are you upset? He said, did we need this twig? I said, it will look nice. That's what photographer thought. Then you should have told me I would have gone and sat near the plant. Like a fool, I said, but there are so many of these. If we took one twig, what great has happened? Why are you so upset? He said, what did you say? So many? In nature, there is never too many. Can you imagine? I used to pluck a blade of glass, put it in my mouth. If they were, I was standing near a bush, I'll pick up a leaf, crush it. That was my instinctive reaction. Now, if I were, I try to pluck anything. Immediately, Karim Bhai comes in front. Do you need it? There is nothing in nature which is written extra. Everything is in its place. So there are teachers of all kinds. This is another teacher I met. In Champaran, we had a Shodhyatra. Out of 150 kilometers of walk, there was one bin, grain bin, which was so beautiful like this. You can see that. Beautiful. Only one. So we asked the lady of the house, why did you make such a beautiful bin? She said, but that's the only way I know. Oh my God. Excellence is imperative. You're helpless. You don't know mediocre way of doing things. No, I don't know. But everybody else has made those. Maybe. I know only this. When you're helpless, you can't do a mediocre job because you're helpless. Oh my God, that culture can produce so much inertia. It is strange, isn't it? Same culture which produces, which generates context for people like Ram Tumari Devi also produces people like us. We become so patient with mediocrity, with something that even we don't approve of. Sometimes you do things which you, even you, from your own standard is not so good, correct? But you manage life. Move on. She didn't. Now look at another teacher, a teacher in paradoxes. You know, the whole world is becoming paradoxical. Future belongs to paradoxes. In every discipline now, we encourage students to learn paradoxically. That means you look at the contradictions. If there's a distribution, look at the two tails of the distribution. All the time, a dialogue and an inquiry is not complete if it looks at only one tail of the distribution. By habit, we should be paradoxical. So let us look at this. This community in Jharkhand is attracting birds, correct? By hanging these pots so that they can collect their manure in the gunny bags and use it in the field. The birds are producing fertilizer. The first fertilizer in the world, which was stated was called Guano. It was collected from Amazon, brought to England. Now look at what happens in my institute. We are designers. We don't design products and services. We also design relationships. We design, and as he says in his class, the last point is connections. We connect different worldviews, different parts of our life. We are, we are connecting or disconnecting. Sir, they make noise because they come and sometimes they make love, sometimes they do something else outside my window. Arey, yaar, kya dikkat hai? Love is the most beautiful thing in this world. Isn't it paradox? I teach, I want you to become sensitive to nature and I do this. You wouldn't believe me, na? You still say that you are a hypocrite. Of course, this is hypocrisy of the highest order. How do we learn from collective intelligence? This is one subject becoming extremely topical now, all over the world. Gandhiji, on 24th July 1929, gave a call, a global call for ideas. The award was 7,700 pounds. At that time, 1 lakh rupees. In today's currency, it will be about 10 crore rupees. Award was for redesigning the spinning wheel. And if you look at this announcement that Gandhiji designed, it gives you the boundary conditions of the final solution. He doesn't know, he didn't know what will be the final solution. But he said, the count of the yarn should be so much. 
the weight of the machine should not be as much that it becomes difficult to move it. The working of the machine should not make a woman tired in eight hours of work. The maintenance cost should not be more than 20% of the machine's cost in a year. All this he is specifying in the design. Can you imagine? He has looked at and then he says, you can have a patent. But if you want the award money, you have to assign the patent to the church committee. First crowdsourcing of the design was done in 1929. You don't think it is a recent phenomena? This is another example of the same process at a community level. Idea is same that we want to learn from strangers, from people around. So this festival in Sikkim requires you to collect nine grains on that date around Rakshabandhan from nine different grains from nine neighbor. So let us say the next door neighbor gave you a particular bean, sprouted bean. The next neighbor also gave you the same sprouted bean. You have to go further till you find nine different grains, which may mean you may have to go to 40 people or 50 people. What are you doing? You are renewing your social network. People whom you normally don't meet, that day because the culture has created a ritual, you have to meet all of them and say hello and how are you and okay, what are you going to give me? And everybody keeps these pots of sprouted grains. What a wonderful way of restore, reviving the contacts, making the community come to know each other, renew the connections. So I was, we were walking in Kangla, we saw this tree and we went to the tree. Bhai, kya hua? I asked the tree. The tree said, look, I'm not supposed to branch. But by mistake, I did. So I did the next best thing. I made it a parallel stem. Yaar, kamal hai. That's great. So I said, that's a very interesting point because when I'm talking to you, some cells in my body are going through mutation. Thank God that they're not cancerous. So I can continue to talk to you. What is my body doing? It is either repairing them or replacing them or bypassing them or regenerating them. It's doing something which keeps my machinery working without creating any problem. This capacity of a system to redesign itself during the process of use is called autopoiesis. So when we design some products and services and during the process of its utilization, it can learn and adapt and improve according to the needs and variable needs and changing needs of the users, that will be an autopoietic design. So if a knife, after cutting things, becomes sharper, there are knives like that. Because they are given a lot of temper. That is autopoietic. It is repairing itself. It is healing itself. Challenge. Very difficult concept. But nature teaches us this. This theoretically, or I mean not theoretically, empirically, this possibility exists in nature. All of us are evident of evident proof of that. In our own body, it is happening. Large number of bath, compensatory pathways emerge in our life. In our neural networks, sometimes some cells are in a problem, then other cells, synaptic connections emerge in our network and they compensate for the connections that were weak or otherwise. We can repair, I mean, we can, our body can heal itself. Doesn't it heal itself? Of course it can. How do we learn from nature, therefore? So, all of these teachers that I mentioned about are teachers who help us to learn from the grassroots level. They don't charge us fees. None of the teachers charge any fees to me. I'll be honest. That doesn't mean that there's no fees due to them. I'm in a debt of them. Isn't it? They taught me such useful lessons, which I'm sharing with you. And how do I pay that fees? By being more empathetic in whatever I do, by being more inclusive in whatever I do, and by in ensuring that I don't lead to exclusion of the, cons of the community, of the nature, of the people, of the needy people in my research, in my design, in my activities. So we try to search, spread, celebrate innovations, and sense the unmet need. These are the four functions every Shodhyatra invariably entails. You could have an innovation club and the club would do the same thing. Search, spread in local language. 
क्रॉस पोलिनेशन इन मराठी इन तेलुगू इन तमिल इन गुजराती नॉट जस्ट इन इंग्लिश लोकल कम्युनिटीज डोंट अंडरस्टैंड इंग्लिश मोस्ट ऑफ दैम सो दैट मीन दू नॉट शेयरिंग विद दैम यू मे क्लेम दैट यू आर शेयरिंग विद दैम बट यू नॉट In 1988, Professor Anil Gupta got thinking about how creative knowledge holders across rural India were not being acknowledged by the system. In search of a fair solution, he came upon the metaphor of the honeybee. Honeybee does what intellectuals don't do. It does cross pollination. The flowers don't feel short change when you take when they they attract the bees, and third, whatever the honey they collect, they don't keep it themselves. So the Honey Bee Network was born. It brings together like-minded individuals, innovators, and farmers, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and non-governmental organizations. It promotes people-to-people -people learning. cross pollination of ideas in local languages and an acceptance of individual and community creativity it protects people's knowledge rights and shares the benefits